Good morning and welcome to all of you. This should be a real treat. Our speaker is, as you know, Dr. Tom Chamberlain. He graduated from the University of Michigan with an MD and a PhD in neuropsychology. He came to Colorado for an internship and loved Colorado, but he was drafted into the Army during the Vietnamese War and spent time at Fort Riley, Kansas, Fort Boise, Texas, and Camp McCoy in Minnesota. After he had finished that stint, he returned to Denver to finish his residency. And um, being exposed to smaller towns during the military, he now looked for a smaller town to relocate. Um, a, a small town in Colorado specifically that needed an internist. He and his wife felt it would be better to raise their children in a small town and he felt like that would enable him to make a difference. So they came to Montrose in 1971 and he immediately started an education program for the doctors on staff. At the hospital, he was director of medical education there for 30 years. He was on the board of directors for Montrose Regional Hospital for 20 years. He has published five scientific papers and received numerous awards. His community interests are Magic Circle Players, where he has performed in over 30 plays and directed 16. Black Canyon Barbershop Chorus, where he was director, and he now marks 50 years of membership in Rotary. In addition, he and last week's speaker, Kelvin Kent, were instrumental in building the Montrose Pavilion. So he certainly has come to a community where he could make a difference and has made a difference. We're going to switch gears from all that medical stuff today, however. And as you can see from the slide, um, he's taking us elsewhere. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Tom Chamberlain for Underwater Beauty of the Caribbean. Tom. Sorry for the long bio, but it was half as long as Kelvin's last year. <laughs> uh, before we jump in the water, let me tell you about the ABC Islands. Uh, millions of years ago, there was a continental drift collision between two plates and that big hunk of land was now formed north of Venezuela. And over the millions of years of weathering, it turned into three flat islands. There's a little bit of a limestone and the volcanic rock, so there's some hills on that, but they're pretty much flat desert islands now. <clears throat> this makes up the ABC islands, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao. Um, there originally were the Arawak Indians there, but the Spanish, when they came all through the Caribbean, they grabbed all the islands, including these. Of course, there were some French and English, the Portuguese that came and went. But the Spanish uh, controlled these islands until the 17th century when the Dutch came in. And they've pretty much been in control since then. They're still uh, territories of the Netherlands in different kind of relationships with the Netherlands. Uh, mainly uh, slavery was what kept these islands going over the years. They were big in the slave trade. They had some uh, um, sugar cane going on in Aruba and Curacao. And they had the salt ponds and the Bonaire. And the slaves were the economy. And when the slaves were abolished, then the uh, economy tanked. But then the oil came to the rescue of Venezuela, 
and they became then a vacation thing for Venezuela, as well as the fact they put refineries, um, at least a little bit of Curacao. But now it's all tourism. And the nice thing about these islands is that they're in an area that misses the storm belt, so they rarely get any kind of bad weather or hurricanes. Uh, okay, let's move on here. Turn the lights off? Yeah, please turn Well, off we the can't because we're video. Oh. Oh, okay. He needed it for the video. <coughs> the video. He needed it for the video. The lights. We have to keep the lights on. All right. Oh, we can do that. Uh, don't have enough hands. Uh, this is where we stay when we go to Bonaire, and there's a hundred dive sites here, but this particular one is the only one that has a stairway, mm -hmm. and uh, not a ladder, but actually stairs, so for old folks like uh, Doris and I, we can easily sit here, put on our flippers and masks, and fall into the ocean, and there's obviously coral right here. And we can do this twice a day, every day, and have a great time. Occasionally, we'll try some of the other dive sites, but we need help then. And uh, Tom and uh, his wife, Melissa, will uh, take care of us and help us in and out some of the difficult dive sites. This is the name of the condos, Den Laman. Now, there's I can say 100 dive sites, but this particular one is unique for that entry. And this is one of the dive sites. So this is a place, particularly for older people, if you want to have easy snorkeling or mm -hmm. easy diving, this is it. Which island is This is on Bonaire. <coughs> this is our view out of our veranda upstairs. And across the way there, you see the small island of Kleina Bonaire, which is uninhabited but has some dive sites. Some of the animals that live on Bonaire, there's not many, but there's plenty of iguanas. You'll see some wild goats. You'll see wild donkeys. And they'll come up and put their head in your car window if you leave it open. Uh, they're very uh, tame. And that's about it for the animals. Uh, the terrain, it's like I say, it's a desert, so you've got cactus and thorn bush. Now, yeah, they planted some uh, coconut palms here and there, but that's not native to Bonaire or any of the ABC islands. Uh, they do have some uh, petroglyphs. I believe this is a pictograph. And there's some protective uh, things there to keep us away from any vandals. The other thing in the south of the Bavon uh, area, an incredible array of salt ponds, a big salt industry. And those white mountains are salt. And almost every day there's a ship that comes up and they have that conveyor belt of <coughs> loads of full of salt. This was all run by slaves at one time and they still have these little huts where the uh, slaves could sleep. Here's some of these salt ponds and there's a lot of shrimp that love that brine which means there's flamingos everywhere. Uh, here we are with Tom and Melissa. I can look at the terrain here. This is some other dive site which uh, we needed help getting out of the water here. But it's time to jump in the water. So we're going to make some graceful entries here. And uh, of course, it's happy as a clam in the water. When you're laying in the water, all your aches and pains go away. It's delightful. Some green sea turtles. 
come get some water really up close pictures. And these are all done, pretty much all of these pictures are my, from my son Tom, who's uh, pretty experienced <coughs> in diving and the photography. These are abandoned butterfly fish, and uh, if they got spooked, they'd probably run back to that, uh, those linear sea fans back there where the stripes will help camouflage. In the ocean, it's eat or be eaten. I mean, constantly, everything down there is trying to find something to eat, and at the same time, looking over their shoulder because somebody's trying to eat them. And so the survival mechanisms that all these animals have developed is absolutely astounding. And I was really interested in that. Of course, the most obvious one is just go to school. <clears throat> if a hammerhead wants to have uh, three small mouse grunts for breakfast, if you're at a school of 30, you've got a chance. If you're walking around with just you and your two buddies, you're toast, unless you're the fastest swimmer. But this is a big school of uh, smallmouth grunts, and there's a school of porgies above it. A good uh, example of brain coral, that's a little fairy passlet. to the right. <coughs> This uh, tube sponges are always spectacular to see. Uh, there's a little black bar soldier fish up in the left corner. <coughs> uh, soldier fish all have the great big eyes, and I assume that's partly protective because if an animal has big eyes like that, maybe he's more ferocious than you think. Beautiful example of a French angel fish. They're gorgeous fish. This is what they look like when they're juveniles. And this is so typical of fish. When they go from babies to juveniles to adults and to old fish, they change dramatically. Um, talk about camouflage. This is a peacock flounder who has uh, got his color completely matching the background there. And if you didn't know what you were looking for, you wouldn't even see it. And here's another peacock flounder on a white background. See how they change? And even the blotches on the fish match the blotches on the rock. Incredible camouflage. This is an interesting yellow sponge with a sharp-tailed eel up in the right. Yeah, this is an interesting coral with a little damsel fish hiding in it. These are blue parrotfish, and they're very unusual for parrotfish. Parrotfish all have their jaws on the tip of the face, and these have their jaws and mouth under it. So they don't have the beak like other parrotfish that can chew off coral and eat clamshells and things like that. They live on sand. So whatever kind of microplankton hangs on the sand, that's what they live on. It's a squid with the tentacles trailing, and they use the trailing tentacles for <coughs> fins as they swim. This is a, a spotted eagle ray. Notice the incredibly long tail. Uh, this is typical of the juvenile spotted eagle ray. They get these ridiculously long tails that will shorten as they get older. That's a little trunk fish hanging out down there. You often see two fish or of either species or the same species hanging out. And I don't understand quite what this is all about. <clears throat> I mean, here you've got a, a grouper hanging out with a green moray eel. And if you go off and spend some time somewhere else and come back in 10 minutes, they'll still be sitting like that. And the question is, 
maybe the fact there's two of them instead of one, it's maybe some protection. Is one waiting for the other one to eat and get the crumbs? Uh, is one of them waiting for the other person not to notice and they're going to reach over and bite his head off? Uh, maybe they're just buddies. I don't know. Probably all of that is possible. This is a, a four-spotted cone jellyfish. It has two spots on both sides. But just to look at it, it's scary. It looks like something out of a Halloween movie. Uh, looks like a monster. Uh, obviously, uh, I think a predator would think twice about attacking this thing. It's a, uh, a southern stingray. This is a, a beautiful vase sponge. And the colors and the beauty, it's just incredible. And when you're diving and you get below eight, 10 feet, the colors just really fade. You can't appreciate it. So when, when you get really down deep where all this neat stuff is, you gotta have light. So with the proper lighting equipment, you can get these kind of pictures, which would be washed out if you didn't have the light. This is a scorpion fish, and it's hard to find. Talk about camouflage. Not only do they change color, but they have a, a texture that matches all the rough coral and rocks. If it weren't for that little fin hanging out, you wouldn't even see it. They do have venomous spines, uh, so that you can get pretty bad uh, burns and uh, bites from the uh, venom that they have won't be fatal, but you can get sick from it. A sea urchin. It's a, a four-eyed butterfly fish. And uh, another good example of some of the camouflage. Because the eye is up here hidden in this bar. So this fake eye on either side gives the illusion that uh, they're bigger than they, you think they are. Also, you can't tell if they're coming or going. <laughs> this is a flamingo tongue. I've never seen a flamingo tongue, so I don't know why they call it that, but I guess it must look like the tongue of a flamingo. But these are white snails, essentially, in their branks. But they can pull this membrane over their body to hide when they're in some kind of a different environment. You can see the background coral is all nodular like that, so that by bringing that membrane over them, uh, certainly gives them some protection. You know, it sort of looks similar to that. Here's another pair. And again, they're on a coral that's sort of lumpy like that, so they have that membrane covering them. But what they look like when they're all by themselves, when they don't have that membrane covering them, they're just a white uh, shell of a snail. Tom loves to get in the nooks and crannies, and uh, these are little tiny banded uh, coral shrimp. But this is minutia. You're talking about little ditty things. This is a box crab, and this is very confusing. Um, first place, you can barely see it. This camouflage is so good. Secondly, what you do think you see is his big mouth. Well, that's not his mouth. His mouth is tiny. These are his eyes. These are his claws crossed in front of him, giving the illusion that he's got this giant jaw. So first place you can't see him, if you do see him, you wouldn't want to get near him. So it's beautifully camouflaged. These are worms, and their antenna have evolved into filter feeders. So this is called a feather duster worm. 
And what used to be antenna are now these spectacular filter feeders if they live on plankton. They also come in this variety, what they call Christmas tree worms, where these <coughs> antenna have really evolved into Christmas trees. Spectacular. And this is a vase sponge, and you can see some of the Christmas tree worms on the side here, showing you how tiny they are in comparison to the uh, sponge. This is an anemone, and uh, Creatures tend to hide in these. These anemones uh, have uh, tentacles that have stingers on them with a neurotoxin. So uh, not many fish are allowed to hang out here. They do occasionally allow some of the small fish to hang out. But of course, if they get hungry, well, the fish is gone because they can sting it and paralyze it with the neurotoxin that they make. Now, they won't hurt humans, they're not that powerful, but they uh, are a poisonous uh, animal. And uh, hiding here is a cleaner shrimp. And hiding down here is an arrow crab that you can hardly see. But this is what an arrow crab looks like. The body is just this little tiny arrowhead. This is an interesting fish called a spotted drum. Yeah, there's no spots. <laughs> but uh, this is a juvenile, and the tail fin here is stretched way out incredibly. It, it doesn't balance with the fish, so it just looks spectacular. When they grow up, now they've got their spots with a bizarre dorsal fin that looks crazy. I've never seen one outside of the picture. They're not very common. Spotted drum. I love this fish to look at it first here. Doesn't that look scary? The big eyes, the mouth, and the fins sticking out like ears. Of course, you're looking at the tail end of the fish. His eyes are up here at the top. This is a wet burfish. And his face is sort of cute. He doesn't look so dangerous when you look from the front, but that's pretty good camouflage. Coming up from behind, it looks like a monster. This is a fireworm. And yes, if you touch him, you get a little burn. That's another one, different color. This is a green moray eel, <clears throat> and like most eels, you never see them swimming like this. They're always in a crack somewhere, with their head poking out. But when you do see them swimming, you right away take a picture. So Tom's got a lot of pictures of eels swimming around, but you really don't see that. That's, that's rare. And they've got a striped grunt hanging down here. This is a lionfish, which has become a problem uh, pretty much all over. They were native to oh, the North Pacific area. Now they spread to Australia. Now they spread to the Caribbean and they're everywhere. A female lionfish lays eggs once a year, but she puts out two million eggs each year. There's no predators for this fish. Its venom is very strong, can't be fatal. Uh, and you don't see them a whole lot in the shallows, but you get out there and start diving, and they're everywhere. Some interesting uh, sponges here. The gorgeous beauty at the bottom of the ocean. It's just astounding, the corals and the sponges. Some vase sponges. Here's a couple of fish hanging out again. And uh, it's a trumpet uh, fish hanging out with a French grunt. And uh, 
there they are hanging out. And if you come back in 10 minutes, they'll still be in the same place. And I have no idea why that happens, but it's sort of neat. I like to think they're buddies. Incredible beauty here of all the corals and sponges. If you look real close down here in the bottom, there's a baby lionfish. I love this fish, it's a balloon fish, but they have the cutest face. And uh, the person who designed the alien person in the movie E.T., this is what they used as their model were the faces of the box fish. There's a whole bunch of these box fishes, and they all have this E.T. face. This is a balloon fish. Beautiful green sea turtle. Another uh, one of the flamingo tongue nudibranchs. Here's a, a sharp tailed eel out swimming around. Here's a spotted moray eel swimming around. These are blue tangs. Tangs are interesting because they're part of the surgeon fish family, and the surgeons never go anywhere without a scalpel. And on the tail of the surgeon fishes, there's a little spot right about there on the tail, that yellow spot. It's actually a little bony protuberance. It's razor sharp. So that can be their defense mechanism. Uh, the blue tanks typically also school, so this is how you usually see them. And every one of them has that little yellow uh, scalpel on their tail. So uh, kids were taking off all their diving gear. They saw a pod of dolphins off the pier right there at our dive site. So they put on their flippers and masks and all went out to play with the dolphins. And this is Melissa heading to chase that dolphin there. A couple of buddies swimming along. You can get really close because they don't care about humans. They're actually curious and playful and they're not, they don't uh, run away from you at all. It's a spotty, spiny lobster. Again, if you look in all these cracks and crannies, you'll see a lot of these, but they're hard to find. They're pretty well disguised. Here is an anemone that's advertising his poisonous tips. Makes it look more ferocious. Spectacular lionfish. Just spectacular. They look ridiculous, don't they? <laughs> Here's another scorpion fish. Different color to match the background. Don't step on them. Some beautiful uh, sponges, coral. Some interesting coral. Uh, you have a French grunt up there and the trunk fish down here. This is an interesting fish. It's, a, it's one of the cowfish family and they have these little tiny horns between their eyes, little bitty horns. I guess that makes them a cowfish. This is a honeycomb cowfish. Some more of these uh, black barred soldier fish. Some Christmas tree. Well, those are feather duster worms there. This is a file fish. And again, they change dramatically from juvenile to adult. So. This is a white spotted file fish. And yes, there are no spots on this fish here, but he had them when he was younger. Tom said he got this on a night dive. I, this is some kind of anemone, I think, and I have never seen anything like it. It's a bizarre. This is banded sea urchins, little white spots. I've never seen those before either. 
these two lumps of whatever it is, they're both octopus. They're the most camouflaged things. You could step on them, you can kick them, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe they're alive. If you get the right light, you can start to see a little bit. Uh, you can see the eye here. You can see some of the uh, suction cups on their tentacles. You can see the siphon, which they use to propel themselves. They can shoot water out the siphon. So if the camouflage isn't enough, they can pump out a lot of black ink, cloud the water, shoot water through that siphon tube and shoot like a jet plane to another spot where they can become, become another lump of dirty clothes or they can sneak through a crack. They can get real skinny and slide through a crack in the rocks and disappear. They're an amazing animal and supposedly more intelligent than most of the other animals. And you seldom see two together like that. They're very solitary. This is a uh, hairy clinging crab, well described. He's clinging to the coral, and he's pretty hairy, and you can barely see him. Good camouflage. Uh, anemone with some Christmas tree worms. Again, we're talking Manisha. He, he's got the the camera right down close in a crack here, probably. This is more typical of how you see a moray eel. This is a spotted moray eel sticking his head out of the crack of some beautiful coral and sponges. This is a good example of elkhorn coral. Melissa is trying to find what's in the cracks and crannies. This is a pretty fish, it's a rock beauty. There's a couple of fairy basslets off to the right. Some lavender tube sponges, they're beautiful. Another scorpion fish, almost impossible to see them with perfect camouflage. This looks like some lettuce floating there. Well, it's a lettuce slug. So it's a sea slug that's got some good camouflage. These fish are interesting. They're striking the black gorgon. And they uh, have face paintings. They, uh, I don't know where they go to get their face painted, but they, uh, they have some really intricate little faces. On the, those are sheep's head porkies that are above them. Just a view of all the sea fans. Sea fans come in all kinds of shapes, uh, looking like seaweed and other things, but they're not. They're all living organisms related to sea fans. I think they call them gorgon, gorgonium, gorgoniums, something like that. Yeah. But they're all living creatures. This is a hawk, hawkbill sea, tip, sea turtle. Another lionfish. This is a uh, bat wing crab. It has like a little decal of darker red on its top. It looks like the emblem. They shine up into the sky when they're calling Batman. You know, they put a spotlight and there's a, a decal like thing that looks just like the top of that crab. Bat wing crab. Here's a spotted moray out freely swimming. Another uh, spiny lobster. And these are actually eels, which is weird. These are garden eels. If you get close to them, they all disappear into the sand. Uh, and I, I've never seen this, but uh, I've seen pictures of this. But these little holes all in front here are all where the eels disappeared. As Tom approached for this picture, I imagine a whole bunch of them disappeared. Uh, and eventually they can all run away by just going back into the sand. 
but they're just sitting there wiggling in the water. They're amazing. Here's a nice base sponge with a little arrow crab hiding down there. And here's some beautiful vase sponges. And if you look into that one, you'll see the little banded coral shrimp hanging right in there. Take the time. You should always look into the nooks and crannies. You'll find the neatest stuff. Beautiful corals, sponges, anemone. Can't get prettier than that. You could have that on your wall as a painting. Here's a couple trumpet fish hanging out. Notice they're different colors. Trumpet fish can really change colors. They can quite have a variety of uh, things to do. And there's a little uh, Christmas tree worm hanging there. Another close up. Christmas tree worm. This is a jolt head porgy. No, I don't know why they call it a jolt head porgy, but that's its name. Here's a, another one of these uh, box fish. This is a porcupine fish. And I have no idea why they call it a porcupine fish. But it has that nice little ET face. Good example of brain corals. Another little flamingo tongue on a coral that has a lumpy kind of uh, texture and appearance. So that's why he's wearing his camouflage coat. This is a lizard fish. At first glance, you might think they're a scorpion fish, but you can tell right away because he's not very well camouflaged. You can easily see him. But he's one of these bottom feeders that just lays there. I've never seen one swimming. They always are motionless on the bottom whenever I've seen one. Here's a real close-up of an anemone, and you now have another cleaner shrimp. This is a spotted cleaner shrimp. Here's another view, and now you can see a little Christmas tree worm hanging out in there, too. Two lionfish at once. Ah, they're multiplying in front of our eyes. Palometa. That's a new fish for me. I've never seen this before, but we uh, saw several schools of these in there. Spectacular because they were such a silvery fish with these jet black fins. Barracuda. Another green moray eel. This is a queen parrotfish, and you'll notice the jaws. Those are pretty ferocious beaks, they can bite through most anything. This is a particularly beautiful fish, though. And the parrotfish have quite a variety of different colors. There's a rainbow one that's even prettier than this. Here's another one of the battling crabs. Just some gorgeous sponges and coral. Really pretty. Another lizard fish. These are sergeant majors. Uh, these are some of my pictures. That's why they're not very good. But Tom sometimes doesn't take pictures of the common fish that you see all the time. So I put in a few of these because you will see a lot of sergeant majors. And you'll see these blue-headed uh, wrasses. But sorry for those two pictures, those are mine. Uh, this is the uh, scroll file fish. Typical shape of a file fish, but the coloration on this one is really different. 
and that light blue gray uh, it's like neon it almost lights up when you see it so it's a spectacular fish to see here's a yellow headed grass striped front. this is a baby queen angel fish so it looks so different than the full adult and this may be one of the very prettiest of all the fish you'll see underwater. A queen angel fish, very pretty dramatic. And I think I'll stop here and have time for some questions. But I love Bonaire. It is a neat place. And from our veranda, we every night can see this. You know, it's a nice thing. So, uh, I'll be glad to open up the questions and Tom can help me if, uh, if I can answer. And before we go to questions, we should introduce the other Tom Chamberlain. Would you stand, Tom? He is an architect in town. And um, so if, if you have questions, you may want to address it to either of the two of them. Tom, do you want to kind of just talk for a minute about photography? Um, sure. I don't think I need the mic. Um, this is the rig that I use. It's a pretty inexpensive underwater camera. It's basically a point and shoot that has a couple lens options, the regular lens and the macro lens for those little tiny things. Um, and then it has these auxiliary lights so you can get light on your subject. But that's that's the cheap way to get decent underwater pictures. Um, you know, the guys that take the really beautiful shots that you see in magazines and stuff are using big, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollar camera rigs or more um, with the big quad strobes and all that stuff. But, but this, you know, works pretty good for an inexpensive, you know, option to take some good pictures. And how long have you been doing this? How long have we been diving? <laughs> 30 years? 40 years? 50 years? <laughs> Long time. Yeah. Well, you go on a diving trip almost every year somewhere. We try to do that every year. And uh, Doris and I try to go on a snorkeling trip every year somewhere. We've been to Bowen Air twice and we're going back again in January next year. All of these photos were taken during a single trip this January where we were with Tom and Melissa and uh, fun. Questions? So there are there certain seasons for water quality and clarity and tourism? The best weather in Bonaire is like from January to May. But it's pretty good weather most of the time. You can dive there any time. Any time of year is good that the water clarity is about the same. Depends on how choppy the water is. As you can see from the pictures, most of the time the water is pretty calm. If it gets windy and uh, the water gets choppy, you know, you'll get a little bit of uh, cloudiness. But in general, it's clear water. And what are the costs like? What are the living costs like? Living costs. In Bonaire? I'd say it's probably pretty similar to living here. No, not much different. Yeah, the groceries, trouble is groceries are a little more expensive on those islands because everything everything you buy in Bonaire has to be taken there by ship from you know, probably from Venezuela and go to there. Yeah, they don't grow anything. Well nothing goes there. Yeah, just and, and uh, the coral in good shape, you know, coral bleaching or warming? Or? Yes, you will see some evidence of the bleaching of the coral uh, pretty much anywhere you go on the planet right now. It's just starting to hit bone air bad the last few years. Bone air has just been lucky. Um, it's been in, you know, relatively cool water, and it's been lucky, but it, it's getting hit now. Yeah. Tom, is there anything that can be done about the lionfish problem? <laughs> I 
I guess that's a, a good question. Um, there are several things being done. One is that um, lionfish is being put on the menu at restaurants all over the Caribbean. And it's real popular, become considered a delicacy by divers and snorkelers to eat lionfish because they know they're eating the enemy. <laughs> but they're such a beautiful fish, but they really are taking over and they can't, there's no natural predators. So in Bonaire and most Caribbean islands, it's the one fish that's legal to hunt and spearfish as much as you want with no limit. So lots of people are out there doing that. A lot of people are selling those fish to the markets. Uh, they're in restaurants. There's a lionfish burger food truck on Bonaire that we have lunch at occasionally. So there's that going on. Um, also, people are trying to train nurse sharks to eat those fish. And they're, they're shooting them with spear guns and then feeding them to uh, nurse sharks, which is working except for now it's making the nurse sharks all excited whenever they see a spear fisherman and the nurse sharks are getting aggressive and there's already been several divers bitten by nurse sharks uh, while they're out spear fishing. So, yeah, complications. But, um, what, what does a lionfish taste like? Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> aren't, aren't, they, aren't they venomous? They are venomous, they're venomous in their spines, and you have to be really careful cleaning them. You know, we, we saw a guy on Bonaire who got stabbed by his lion, lionfish in the finger while he was cleaning them, and he ended up going to the hospital and getting an antivenom pumped into him, and his whole hand turned black, and his, almost lost his finger, and it's bad. I mean, it's really bad getting stung by those things. So I didn't like getting anywhere near him, but those guys clean them, they wear these special gloves, and, but it's, yeah, they're nasty. But it's amazing that uh, some fish, like sharks, some kinds of sharks, they just eat them. They don't eat them in the wild, but they're learning to eat them, and once they learn to eat them, then they'll hunt them and eat them, and that's what they're hoping is gonna happen, is that somewhere along the line, nurse sharks will figure out in mass that they can eat those things. But it's hard to say. Your typical invasive species problem. Any other questions? So, Tom, what makes them not have um, predators? What What about the fish? Well, is it just they have predators? predators where they're from. Oh, they're from the South Pacific, Thailand. You know, and in those areas, they have predators, and they're under control there and they're predated and they're part of the ecosystem. Here they were introduced artificially. Actually in the Caribbean it happened by a giant aquarium breaking open and, and falling into the ocean that released like 300 of them into the ocean near Florida. And they've spread throughout the entire Caribbean and there's no natural predators here. Mm -hmm. So it's your typical invasive species problem. Well, can't you import some from Asia? Uh, that's another thing that they've tried to do. Like Hawaii is the classic example when they got rats there accidentally. They said, well, we can't get rid of the rats, so let's import mongooses, because mongooses eat rats, right? Well, they do eat rats, but first they eat all the native birds and all the native species, then they eat the rats, and now you have a mongoose problem. And the mongooses there are like rats. So that's what they're afraid of if they try to introduce a new predator to an ecosystem to control something else. Will it eat something else that's important to the ecosystem? You know, yeah. Same complicated yeah. problem. That, so they don't, you end up with two problems. Yeah. So there's no one. simple answer right yeah. now for what to do. Although hunting, you know, people, a lot of people just love spearfishing. And they can go there and you can spearfish all day, every day in bone air if you want to catch lionfish. They just have to deal with it. Either sell them or you know, just kill them and feed them to you know, creatures underwater and try not to get stung. And that's where people are getting stung. It's getting the damn thing off the barb of your hook into some sort of container without stabbing yourself. Because um, they're just a bunch of hypodermic needles sticking out. And they're super sharp, so yeah. So how big are they in reality? You know, a big lionfish out to the perimeter of the spines is this big. Mm -hmm. A little baby is all different sizes, you find them all different sizes, but a big one would be like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And so even the big fish, the actual fish in there, is enough for one line burger. You know, one line fish burger. That's all you get out of a big one. So, yeah, you got to catch a lot of them too. <laughs> they do. They taste good. They're they're a good fish. But mild. Two questions. Two questions. Uh, well, thank you all for wait, coming. Wait, wait, wait. One more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sorry. Two questions. I'm wondering uh, uh, what kind of damage is a lionfish doing to the environment? And then I was wondering about the availability of dive shops and, and dive tours uh, on the island. Okay, well, Bonaire is a diving island. There's 20 dive shops on the island, and if you want to dive or snorkel or have guides or go out on boats or get training, or it's all over the island. It's all about diving. Probably more than any other single island in the Caribbean, Bonaire is the dive island. So there's that. The big impact that lionfish have on the environment is that they eat baby fish. So they're gulp, they're, they're uh, surprise predators. So they wait for little fish to swim by and poof, suck them in. And they eat little white goldfish sized fish. So they eat hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of baby reef fish. That's their main damage that they're doing is they're killing off, you know, all the baby fish that should be going. Oh, word.